Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, our distinguished uh, panel, uh, led by Professor Kureshi QC uh, this afternoon. I take this chance to welcome you uh, to this bespoke webinar that we're speaking about uh, energy sector dispute resolution. Uh, we have uh, a team that is coming from the UK and from across Africa, represented by Professor uh, Olawi and from Kenya and representing the region, East Africa. We are really happy to host this today because we've been asked severally by members uh, of the Law Society to bring a session of this nature. And we are hoping this is a, a start to a longer, much longer discussion, especially given what is happening around uh, the energy sector uh, globally. So I take this opportunity on behalf of the East Africa Law Society Governing Council to welcome you uh, to this session. And I'm hoping it will be a, a beautiful lesson for you to learn and to network. Uh, without having to say much, I'm going to take this back to Noela uh, C. Lubano, who is our moderator for the day. Uh, Noela, welcome. Thank you very much, David. Um, welcome, everyone. Karibuni, Mabibi na Mabwana. Um, welcome to this webinar where today the East African Law Society is going to discuss dispute resolution in the energy sector. My name is Noela Lubano. I'm a partner at Oraro and Company Advocates, and I will be your moderator for the day, which is a great pleasure and honor. As you can see, we have an extremely distinguished panel, and I will begin by introducing Professor Kawar Kureshi QC, who will be our first panelist. And if you will allow me, I will give a bit of an introduction. So the professor, as you all know him, is a British barrister and he's the head of McNair International. He specializes in international arbitration, commercial litigation, as well as public international law. He has undertaken many high profile and complex cases for and against commercial parties and state parties for more than 70 states with hundreds of appearances in arbitration and court matters. He has also appeared before the International Court of Justice on numerous occasions. He frequently sits as an arbitrator and as well as an international in international commercial disputes. He has taught commercial law in the University of Cambridge, public international law at King's College London, and was appointed a visiting professor in commercial law at the University of London in 2006. He's widely published in the fields of arbitration, commercial litigation, and international law, and is frequently invited to speak. So I'd like to take this um, opportunity to welcome Professor Kawar Kureshi. Karibu. Thank you very much, Noella. Thank you to the East Africa Law Society for inviting me to address you on this subject. The previous seminar that we had, which was dealing with bilateral investment disputes attracted an audience of more than 200 and the questions were fast and furious in the sense of uh, the, the number of questions. I'm delighted that on this panel, I'm joined by colleagues who will provide you with a very broad insight as to energy disputes. We will have a colleague from an international law firm, highly regarded uh, David Goldberg from White and Case, speaking about uh, the energy uh, sector from his perspective, doing a lot of disputes involving Russia and the CIS. Uh, as well as uh, the, the the inward investment that's been coming in from Russia, notwithstanding the unfortunate situation that has been developing since the 24th of February. Also, one of my colleagues, Damilola, who's a senior advocate in Nigeria, uh, extremely experienced in energy disputes, will speak about the Nigeria experience. I have produced a PowerPoint. I'm grateful to Joseph Dyke from my office for uh, putting this together, and he will also operate it. It's a very extensive PowerPoint. If we move on to the next slide, which gives you the index, I'm only going to focus on uh, what uh, an introduction, what the range of any disputes is. Then I'm going to give you some examples of investment treaty claims against East African states, as well as providing a checklist. You'll see from the, from the PowerPoint, I've also made reference to what are called stabilization clauses and given you examples from Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, as well as making reference to bilateral investment treaties. But let's start with an introduction in the time that's available. 
And what we understand is that Africa accounts for about 9% of global oil exports. The four of the top 30 oil producing countries are in Africa, Nigeria, Angola, Algeria, and Egypt. I know from my own experience, because of the, in the past 30 years, the work that I've done, not just in the mining sector, where I've been involved in disputes in mining in Botswana, in South Africa, in Congo, I've done mining disputes in, in West Africa as well. I've done oil and gas disputes concerning Ghana for foreign oil companies, Uganda recently, some of you may be aware, the Heritage Oil case, which was an arbitration and also in the commercial court, and some other matters which are confidential. Now, of course, the key uh, difference between arbitration, which is commercial arbitration and investment treaty arbitration, is that investment treaty arbitration increasingly is not confidential, whereas commercial arbitration is. Uh, there are matters that I've been involved in in the oil and gas sector in Africa, which are confidential, which obviously I won't speak about. But insofar as I can relay experience from the other matters, I will do so. Now, of course, despite being home to nearly a fifth of the world's population, the global power supply investment is less than a 20th in Africa. This disparity is shocking and it becomes more apparent when you see satellite imagery of uh, the brightness that is emitted from continents, African continent having less in terms of uh, energy consumption as reflected in the view from outer space than the rest of the world. That's not necessarily a bad thing uh, given the climate crisis that we're facing. But the potential that exists for Africa is all too clear, not just to myself, but also to the foreign investors who are increasingly active in East Africa, my own experience in Uganda, Kenya, a little bit in Tanzania, but Uganda and Kenya, where I'm still appearing in the Kenyan courts, uh, is quite clear that there will be much more inward investment. And there is, as a consequence, dispute resolution potential, both commercial and international. What I wanted to do is move on to the uh, range of energy disputes. And we, when we talk about the energy sector and energy disputes, this is a very broad term. What does it include? It includes, of course, the oil industry, which is developing in uh, Uganda and now Kenya. We've got the gas industry, where we've got uh, gas extraction, liquefaction, nuclear energy industry, which requires huge investment and is very labor intensive, has many concerns surrounding it in terms of safety and disposal of the waste, which is radioactive for thousands of years. The power sector generation and sector where I've been involved in disputes, certainly in the past 12 months in South Asia and uh, Africa, West Africa, particularly power purchase agreements, the way in which the state is trying to enter into agreements for the production of supply of power and the problems that arise. Renewables, a developing sector, of course, there were many hydroelectric plants established in Africa, in East Africa, certainly in Egypt in the 50s and 60s, in West Africa, in Ghana, at a time when the investment was colossal and the power was not cheap, it was extremely expensive. These renewables are coming into their own because of the long term view that's now very clearly held by states where we have to wean ourselves off carbon based energy sources and move in a different direction. Of course, there's still sensitivity about nuclear, but there are many who champion the cause of nuclear on the basis that in terms of carbon emissions, it has the lowest footprint, never mind the difficulties in terms of safety and long-term storage of the materials that are generated by nuclear power sector. Of course, the energy sector is capital intensive. Commodity prices vary. In the United Kingdom, whilst we have what we consider a summer, uh, we're no doubt about to face the winter five months from now, our energy prices have rocketed for a whole host of reasons. And that plays into whether or not investment is going to be made, taking a long-term view. There are regulations in play, environmental regulations, tax regulations, 
the way in which a development is allowed or not, as the case may be, the, the state's understanding, uh, level of understanding of a particular sector has a great deal of influence in the, wh whether or not the regulation is fit for purpose, it's heavy handed, or subsequently has to be modified. There are potentially uh, 11 types of uh, contracts that might generate disputes. I've been involved in all of these in terms of disputes, predominantly in arbitration, commercial arbitration, and also in court proceedings. Uh, production sharing agreements, there's a very large matter that I'm involved in at the moment, where there's a dispute between a state and an all major arising out of production sharing agreement, licenses and concession agreements. These are uh, likely to give rise to disputes uh, in the sense of where perhaps a license has or has not been granted, the nature of the conditions that are imposed for the license, and whether or not there's an expectation that once a license has been granted, it should lead to a production sharing agreement, because the license is exploratory in nature. And the question is whether or not the party that obtains the license has, as a consequence, an entitlement to the production sharing agreement, where, as its name suggests, the oil major comes in, takes the burden of the expenditure to invest in production capacity, and then shares the proceeds, the profits. Joint operating agreements, these are in existence in more mature states, as are joint venture agreements. A unitization agreements uh, lead to disputes, as do transportation storage agreements. Uh, transportation storage agreements often lead to disputes where you have transit. We know that uh, with Uganda, the oil pipeline that may or may not be uh, the subject of dispute, and in other jurisdictions, where energy in its raw form, the raw material, is transiting, agreements have to be entered into, and there can be payments that are extracted for uh, transit, transportation by states, as well as for energy, energy supply. Uh, you've got very major disputes that are arising in terms of shipment of oil, shipment of gas, as well as storage. Uh, in the context of EPC agreements, uh, agreements with contractors can lead to disputes, long-term gas supply agreements. These are entered into very often by gas producers for 10 years, 15 years. Why? They're making a huge investment. The state wants stability of supply. And as a consequence, they're long-term. The contracts include a, a, what's called a price review mechanism, which refers to uh, uh, what the market forces are, market price. And in the, the context of the huge spike in gas prices at the moment, caused by a variety of events, it's likely that we're going to see LNG price reviews, which is the ninth category that I've in, uh, identified uh, being engaged more frequently. Long-term energy contracts, these are familiar to many of you, where they're what, these are called price per, uh, power purchase agreements, where the state en agrees to pay for energy, whether or not it's taken, uh, so-called uh, take or pay, and adjustments are provided for in the contract in case the energy isn't taken or there's a surge in demand, whether or not there's a difference in, in the tariff. These are very complex agreements entered into by states, which provide huge exposure for the state, but the guarantee of payment is necessary for those who are investing because the investment is huge. Uh, energy infrastructure contracts, construction contracts, I've dealt with in overview. Investor state disputes, well, we'll turn to uh, four examples of those in the East African sector. There are many more in the oil and gas sector elsewhere. We've got regulatory disputes and investigations. These loom large, very often in the energy sector where large amounts are involved, where you've got developing jurisdictions. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for the state to seek to impose increased taxes directly or indirectly to demand more compliance ostensibly with environmental requirements and to start investigations. Sometimes, sometimes justified, sometimes not. It's alleged that very often the state will use tax, environment, and the criminal law to 
extract more by way of advantage for the state, whether it's the state more generally or individuals, that's the allegation. And that in itself, if it's if it's engaged in in circumstances where there is protection for the investor and the investor is on strong ground in that the environmental change or the tax change and or the criminal investigation is misconceived could well trigger an investment investor state dispute. This has happened very often in the South American sector where the states have rightly or wrongly tried to change the regulatory framework, the tax framework, and, and also started investigations. I mentioned tax royalty disputes. These are often the uh, cause of arbitrations I've been involved in, taxation related arbitration disputes in the oil and gas sector. Now, the remainder of the slides, which you are, will get access to, deal with stabilization clauses. And I've given you examples of stabilization clauses between that exist in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. And essentially what they provide for is that on the day that a contract is entered into, there is a certain framework, legal framework. If the state changes that legal framework and the investor, the oil and gas company, considers that it's disadvantageous, then the parties must negotiate in good faith to stabilize the, 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 the landscape. I've also mentioned in the PowerPoint the BITs that are in existence between Uganda and foreign states, Tanzania and Kenya. And I can tell you that Uganda has 17 BITs in place, of which six are in force, and there are eight other investment treaties that can be invoked by foreign investors. Kenya has 20 BITs in place, of which 11 are in force, and there are an additional eight treaties that can be invoked by foreign investors. Tanzania has 20 BITs in place, of which 11 are in force, and six others. And as we'll see, at the moment, Tanzania is on the receiving end of multiple exit cases. But let me just turn to uh, three concrete examples of uh, claims that have been brought under BITs and the outcome. The first is Total versus Uganda, where there was a claim brought in 2015 that concerned the imposition of stamp duty on an oil block near Lake Albert. The allegation was that the tax measures breached the Uganda Netherlands BIT. That was a case that was settled and the claim was discontinued. Similarly, in 2012, Tullow Oil sued Uganda over a $400 million capital gains tax dispute. Now, pausing there, I'm very familiar with that matter because I acted for Heritage in a claim that Tullow brought against Heritage and also I acted against Uganda in that context. The claim was ultimately resolved by Tello paying a reduced amount, $250 million. Tello has argued that it had been given an exemption by a government minister from the taxes. And that was a position rejected by the court on the basis that perhaps unsurprisingly, only parliament could approve uh, tax measures. Cortec versus Kenya was a claim brought in the mining sector very recently. And that claim was dismissed. It was under the Kenya UK BIT. That was dismissed in 2018 on the basis that the argument Cortec put forward, which is that the revocation of their mining license was a violation of the BIT, was unsustainable simply because the claim that they advanced was not based upon an investment. As those of you who were participating in the previous webinar will recall, I gave you the outline of what a bilateral investment treaty requires. Fundamentally, it's a protection for a, a foreign investor from a state. And the protection is only in respect of an investment. And it's only if there is an investment, and that's defined very broadly, in play that a claim can be brought for unfair and equitable treatment or expropriation. I mentioned Tanzania. Tanzania has multiple exit cases being brought against it which I understand the state is seeking to deal with. As I mentioned previously, and I mentioned again, of course, it's critically important for foreign investors and the state to receive timely expert advice, ideally when the contract is being entered into, 
and due diligence is being undertaken to ensure that the co contract is commercially viable, that during the operation of the contract, the parties comply with their obligations. And subsequently, if there is even the threat of a, of a, of a dispute, never mind a dispute crystallizing, the commercial party as well as the state have access to sophisticated advice to achieve their best outcomes. Now, the next two slides that I'm going to take you to are providing a checklist from the private sector perspective and subsequently from the state sector perspective. And I make uh, the point clear at this juncture, the 30 years I've acted as much for private sector parties in investment treaty disputes, whether it be bilateral investment treaty claims, as well as acting for states. And I believe that's a, an, a it's useful from my perspective, at least, because I can see it from both sides. And from the private sector standpoint, assuming that an investment has been made in the energy sector, I would be very surprised if that investment hadn't been made with a very clear understanding of the potential applicable law. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes parties enter into contracts without realizing understanding the implications of the applicable law. Only yesterday I looked at a contract which on the face of it seeks to refer to English law, but in one critical aspect, in one of the clauses tucked away is a reference to another legal system, which reference might actually be critical for the particular issue that I was being asked to advise on. And it might in that situation be far more important than the reference to English law. And we'll see whether that is the case. So what is the applicable law of the contract? Uh, is it English law? Is it Tanzanian law? Is it Kenyan law? Is it Ugandan law? Of course, I'm sitting in England at the moment, and English law hitherto has been the most uh, referred to law for contracts. We have the civil law system, which operates in a, in a, in a, in a slightly different way from ours. It's codified. When I say ours, I mean, in East Africa, of course, in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, uh, we have, you have the common law system, which is why it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure for me to appear in the courts of Kenya as an English qualified barrister because of the system. It's very familiar to you. I've advised on Ugandan law matters. I've appeared on arbitrations with colleagues from Uganda. It's a common law system, as are most of uh, the United Nations member states systems, they have their origin in common law and they reflect the common law approach. But what if you've got different contracts? And what if you've got different governing laws? Have you checked what is going to be the implication? Have you got legal advice from the different, uh, from lawyers from the different systems? And what's the dispute resolution process? Is it the local law courts? Uh, is it the local courts, forgive me? Is it arbitration? Is it litigation? If it's arbitration, what's the seat? Is it a seat that you're familiar with? Is it a seat where, critically, the courts will support arbitration or are they likely to interfere? Because that's the key test for an arbitration seat. Do the courts support the, arbit the process of arbitration? Are the judges judges who are familiar with arbitration or are they judges who are likely to be more inclined to interfere with arbitration? Is the contract providing for other steps such as negotiation or mediation? These are multi-step jurisdiction processes, uh, dispute resolution processes. Is there a bilateral investment treaty that can be engaged? Ordinarily, in this context, a foreign investor who is sophisticated will do a check. Can I invoke a bilateral investment treaty? And often on a large scale dispute, even a small scale dispute, the investment will be rooted so as to take advantage of a bilateral investment treaty. And as I've explained for Kenya, for Uganda, for Kenya, uh, for, for Tanzania, forgive me, there are at least uh, six in the case of Uganda, nearly, nearly a dozen in the case of Kenya and Tanzania, investment, treaty, investment treaties that could be used to route an investment through. And that will provide a direct claim to, through an investment treaty tribunal in case there's a suggestion of expropriation, unfair, inequitable treatment, and denial of justice. From the private sector perspective, if uh, you've got a dispute and assuming that you've gone through all of this when you signed up to the contract and so you've got a treaty as a backup you've got arbitration you're familiar with the applicable law and the rights that it might provide you with 
if there's a threat of a dispute, have you identified all of your documents? Uh, have you preserved the documents? If you're in a particular country and you're dealing with documents on local servers, on local computers and or hard copy, do you need to preserve them? Do you need to collate them? Do you need to, even more importantly, ensure that you have copies of at least in a different jurisdiction in case your offices are raided, the documents are seized, and you're not able to access the documents. If you've got people on the ground in the particular jurisdiction, uh, do you need to be able to extract them in the event that unfortunately, as sometimes happens, the state uses coercive powers to prevent you from accessing them? Do you need to obtain a rudimentary witness uh, statement from them right early on? Do you need to identify who your witnesses are going to be from the very beginning? If the dispute is looming, and if you've got a long-term arrangement with the state and you want to maintain your relationship, of course, it's not in your interest, if you're from the private sector, to, for want of a better word, detonate the agreement and go for a dispute resolution. Ideally, you want to be able to settle with an eye to the long-term relationship. But of course, it needs two parties to want to settle. And if the situation is one that's intractable, then you have to start thinking very seriously about what you're going to do. And my advice always is to bring your team together sooner rather than later, your, to identify your documents, to identify your witnesses, to identify who, which expertise do you need? Technical, engineering, oil and gas, quantum. Who can help you if you're going to have to provide for an assessment of damages? Surprisingly, there are not that many people around uh, who can provide the relevant advice when it comes to the oil and gas sector who have appeared in arbitral tribunals or courts before because that's seen as a, a a critical advantage of course we all have to start somewhere we all have to start with our first case our first appearance and it's not necessarily the right to say well you've got to have had at least one arbitration under your belt as an expert before we're going to appoint you Plainly, people have to be given an opportunity. What I would say is, if you've got a private sector dispute, then think very carefully about these issues sooner rather than later. If there's a private sector, dis uh, sector dispute and you're against the state, does your contract require, or the governing law require, that there are certain procedures that you must follow to serve the state if you're going to trigger a dispute? For example, in England, if it's a commercial court matter, and if you've not, if the state hasn't agreed for service in a different way, you have to use diplomatic channels to serve the state. There's a, a case called General Dynamics in Libya, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which held that uh, we have a statutory regime, and the statutory regime exists to ensure that if the state is brought before our courts, it's made fully aware of the legal proceedings. I mentioned earlier the impact, the implication of triggering a dispute. If you just do trigger a dispute, what will happen to your commercial relationship? What will happen to your projects? Critically, is there something else going on in the background which is precipitating a dispute? Is it because you have a competitor who has an eye on your concession and is, for whatever reason, in whatever way, seeking to provoke the state to agitate a dispute involving you. you. I'm sure if you're advising a sophisticated investor private in the private sector, they will have access to the resources which will assist them in trying to ascertain what is going on in the background, assuming that you're not trying to negotiate, not trying to reach out to the state otherwise. If it's going to be arbitration, you need to think very carefully about who you're going to nominate as your arbitrator, as well as who the chairperson is going to be, who's often the critical person. Parties often neglect that the most important person is the chairperson in an arbitral tribunal. And there's a lot of thought that has to go into who you nominate as your arbitrator and therefore, and then who are they likely to nominate and put forward, assuming you have no choice in the matter, although ideally you should, uh, who will be the chair. And if it's going to be an arbitrator, you must ensure that the arbitrator has credibility. You must ensure the arbitrator has availability. You must ensure the arbitrator has expertise. 
It won't help you if you appoint as an arbitrator somebody who's not familiar with the applicable law. It won't help you if you appoint somebody as the arbitrator who isn't um, given the uh, respect that they ought to have if they're sitting on a panel of, of three. And it won't help you if this person is out of their depth when it comes to the particular area of expertise. When it comes to the private sector, in addition to contractual claims, what other claims might they mean? Tort, restitution. And finally, if you're advising the private sector, don't forget the availability, increasing availability of what is called third party funding. If your client doesn't want to spend the resources on legal fees and or doesn't have the funds available to them, they may, subject to obtaining legal advice, which satisfies a third party funder, obtain access to third party funding. Now, moving on, finally, the advising the state. If you're advising the state, and a claim is looming against the state, assuming the state has done all of its due diligence when it entered into the contract, uh, just 13 points that I'll run through very quickly. Who are the parties? Is it the state? Is it a state entity? What difference does it make if it's the state? Does that mean that if the state has an adverse uh, decision, a, a court judgment or an arbitrary award, it makes it easier to enforce? If it's other state holders, uh, what's the impact? How are they going to be brought together? Uh, very often it's said that uh, acting for a state is much more difficult, doesn't matter which state it is, getting instructions, getting the different elements of the state to come together is sometimes much more difficult than commercial parties for a whole host of reasons. No one wants to take responsibility. There may be a vested interest in not working together to try and make somebody look bad and or it may just be about capacity. Uh, whether it's the UK government or, or, or else, elsewhere, civil servants are fond of telling commercial lawyers like myself that they work nine to five. They generally don't get overtime. Whereas for us as lawyers, day and night, uh, ultimately our objective is to do our best for the client. It, if you're the state, be careful. If you're on the receiving end of a, of, of a claim, resist the temptation to uh, trigger the prosecutorial orders because that might just feed into a narrative that you're being oppressive. Think very carefully about whether or not the prosecutorial organs can be engaged. Is there a legitimate basis? If you want to, how do you explain that? Do you have immunity if a claim is being brought against you uh, to the substance of the claim? If you do, then you must raise it early on. Or to enforcement, uh, it's the adjudicative immunity and enforcement immunity that exists and in both respects it's immunity that you can waive so be extremely careful if there's an arbitration agreement was it validly concluded was any kind of permission required for the government entity to enter into an arbitration agreement do you need foreign counsel this is a, an important point this is not me advertising our wares, whether mine or David's or Damalola's or anybody else's. The brutal reality is that unfortunately, some states go to either extreme. They'll either engage foreign lawyers completely and they will engage foreign lawyers without any uh, regard to capacity building in the process, or they'll do try and do it all themselves. Both are, in my view and my experience, uh, ill-advised. Of course, there is the need to engage sophisticated legal advice, but it ought to be done in circumstances where you can also capacity build. And if you're against lawyers who are extremely sophisticated, then it perhaps is unwise to take them on without having a clear understanding of the arbitral process, without having a clear understanding of the implications of the procedure that's at play. If you're acting for the state, who is going to give instructions on behalf of the state? Who are you going to appoint as an arbitrator? There are some arbitrators who are well known, but nevertheless seen as pro state and pro investor. What are the rules? Make sure you're familiar with the rules. Do the rules require uh, you to, or have the potential for provisional measures? If they have the potential provisional measures, please do not behave like an ostrich. If you have signed up to an arbitral process, engage with it. 
because if you don't and you miss deadlines or you avoid provisional measures, you will create an impression. Arbitrators are, of course, human beings who should be objective, they should be impartial, but they're human beings. And each and every one of us can create an impression very quickly. And first impressions, unfortunately, tend to last. Engage. If provisional measures can be granted, they can be granted very swiftly. Don't avoid entering into an appearance because that might just confirm the narrative that you're a state that is being heavy handed as opposed to you lack resources or there isn't somebody who has dealt with it swiftly enough. Confidentiality. Do you want the proceedings to be confidential? Actually, sometimes confidentiality is used as a, as a cloak for embarrassment by uh, states. Do you want them to be public? Is it a, a pressure point that the other side can use against you? Because they believe that by some means leaking the existence of these proceedings will cause embarrassment and bring you to the negotiating table more swiftly. Are there bribery, corruption or other regulatory issues raised by the dispute? Increasingly, it's the case that states will say to counsel such as myself, oh, there's something not right about this. Well, fine, there's something not right about it, but where's the evidence? And ultimately, uh, asserting bribery and corruption is far easier than proving it. Yes, on large scale contracts, it may exist, but be fully aware of the implications of raising a bribery corruption allegation and being unable to prove it. In the same way, challenging an arbitrator is happening more frequently, but you have to be able to sustain a challenge. Otherwise, you will have created a fairly negative impression amongst the arbitral tribunal collectively, which no doubt they will seek to put to one side, but as human beings, be mindful of the risk that you create. Evidence. All too often states will say, oh, we can't disclose this because it's sensitive, because it's confidential. Think very carefully about the impression that you're going to create. Where's the funding going to come from? I mentioned third party funding. The third party funding itself has proven problematic in the past because foreign investors have often not disclosed the existence of third party funding or perhaps used it as a potential lever to say to the state, well, I'm funded and the third party funder is good for the money. I'm going to take this all the way. You state obviously will have to have access to public resources. How are you going to fund it? This is by way of an overview. I once again, I'm delighted to participate in this uh, event with you. The full PowerPoint will, will, will be available uh, for circulation subsequently but I'll pause there and we'll take questions later. Thank you, Joseph, for assisting on the PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Professor Qureshi, for that very comprehensive summary on the range of disputes that one can encounter in the energy sector and those very useful tips on the checklist that one should be having in mind when they're considering acting for a state or a private party. You know, those tips range from the kind of documentation you should have, how you should store it, how you should back it up, to the kind of experts that you should pick. I think it was very useful. I really enjoyed it. And thank you again for always mm -hmm. being there to give us this kind of um, um, enlightenment. Thank Thanks. You. So our next speaker is Mr. David Goldberg. Um, David is a partner in the London office of a leading law firm that is White and Case. He's a solicitor advocate and his practice focuses on international commercial and investment arbitration. He's recognized in many leading legal directories for his expertise in complex investment disputes and disputes involving states, as well as those arising out of corporate transactions. He is one of the only three lawyers in the world that is ranked band one for dispute resolution in Russia, expertise based abroad, and he's featured in the Hall of Fame by Legal 500 2018. Um, David has experience of arbitrations conducted under the LCIA, ICC, ICAC, ICSID, SCC, and on his UNCITRAL arbitration. His experience covers a broad range of sectors, including oil, gas, metals and mining, telecommunications, manufacturing, financial services, and insurance. He's also regularly appointed as an arbitrator and has made many recent appointments, including under the LCIA, the ICC, the SCC, 
as well as the unsettled truths. Um, David will speak from the perspective of key issues for states and foreign investors in the context of energy disputes, as well as other things. Welcome, David. We're very happy and honored to have you on this distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a pleasure to be um, here with you, and I thank organizers for the opportunity to take part. Well, um, I'd like to engage with many points raised by the previous speaker, but um, I'll stick to what I originally decided to speak about. Um, just one point to add, um, when dealing with disputes involving states, both for the state and um, against the state, I think the role of local lawyers shouldn't be underestimated. Um, in my view, there should be um, a good team of international lawyers and local lawyers to ensure success. So coming back to my topic, um, well, I was born in Ukraine, then Soviet Union. I've lived in London for more than 30 years and I've acted for the Russian Federation um, in a number of cases for more than eight years now. So I will use my 10 minutes or so to provide a brief update on the energy market in relation to Russia and Ukraine. The effect of the war in Ukraine and sanctions on numerous deals and provide my view on relevant issues likely to arise from current situation. As you all know, in March, on 8th March 2022, US President Joe Biden announced a ban on US inputs of Russian oil and gas to target the main artery of Russia's economy, as he put it. Crude oil hit its highest price in more than seven years, with the price of Brent crude rising from $70 per barrel several months before to more than $129 per barrel after the announcement, immediately after the announcement. Also, on 8th March 2022, following a 250% rise in the nickel price within 24 hours, the London Metal Exchange suspended trading of nickel on the exchange due to a systematic risk to the market and in an unprecedented move cancelled all trades um, that took place that morning, effectively uh, rewinding the market to its closing position on 7th March. So the war in Ukraine has resulted in interesting potential developments for Africa. First, there are now opportunities to export more gas to Europe, taking into account Europe's desire to reduce and eventually eliminate its dependence on Russian energy. We have seen that recently, Italy, for example, turned to Angola, Algeria, and the Republic of Congo for its gas supply. At the time the Russian companies, um, or at the same time, um, the Russian companies are also actively looking to diversify their business and to test and find new markets. According to some analysts, Nigeria and Morocco have become major destinations for Russian gasoline and NAFTA, as well as Senegal, Sudan, Ivory Coast and Togo. One of course needs to be careful in dealing with Russian companies to ensure that no sanctions are breached. And sanctions need to be carefully considered not only for any new deals, but also for existing relationships with Russian companies. As of early 2022, four Russian companies were present in different onshore and offshore locations in several African markets. Overall, Russian players tend to act as operators in North Africa, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, while they mainly act as partners in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo and Mozambique. Exceptions include Luke Oil's operationship in Equatorial Guinea and Congo. Luke Oil seems to be the most active Russian oil company in the Gulf of Guinea sub-region, even if it does not operate any producing project in the, in the area. Gazprom and Tatneft are also present in North Africa, while Rosneftigas is the sole Russian oil company to hold working interests in East Africa. Moreover, 
Russian players are active in all types of upstream projects, from exploration to development and production assets in Africa. In March 2022, international communities started to impose financial and operational sanctions on Russian oil companies as a response to the military operations in Ukraine that began in late February 2022. These measures are expected to impact several upstream projects in Africa. Well, I'll just highlight some exploration activities that are at risk. Well, in Tunisia, Lukoil operates the Heba, Heba Marine Exploration Permit in shallow waters of the Lagian Basin. So, Lukoil has not been active in this project since 2012, when it suspended due to force majeure. Well, now I doubt this project is likely to take off with a local um, active participation in light of current sanctions. In Libya, that neft may stop drilling in the coming weeks due to an impossibility to finance the operations. Gazprom also operates four exploration blocks offshore in the Pelagian Basin. Although some announcements were made in recent years about the resumption of exploration work, the company was not performing any activity as of early 2022. Then in Nigeria, operator Chevron, uh, sorry, uh, Chevron and um, um, partner Lukoil, and that is yet again Lukoil, one of the largest Russian private oil companies, have um, had plans to further explore um, certain uh, deep water block. Well, such expensive exploration campaign will clearly not be undertaken under full guarantee regarding the funding. In Congo, Lukoil also operates two large exploration, exploration blocks with ENI as a partner. In Mozambique, operator ExxonMobil um, and um, partners with Rosneft, Qatar Energy and ENI. Again, there are drilling plants and um, the first drilling might be located within the Zambezi Delta with, this, with the further works anticipated in 2023. This will, of course, be delayed um, and um, it will be interesting to see how contractually the parties are going to deal with those delays. Then, of course, um, FID and development projects that are likely to be delayed. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, Lukoil is very active in three projects where FIDs are expected to be taken in the short term. These key milestones are now at risk, as the company has a minimum of 30% working interest in this project when it is not operator. These are in Cameroon, in Ghana, in Equatorial Guinea. As a lawyer and an arbitrator, I have been acting for and against Russian companies, private and state-owned, in various disputes involving shareholder rights, supply contracts, joint venture agreements, etc. And um, I can say that the situation now is of course unique in that there is a constantly changing landscape of sanctions imposed by different countries or the European Union. And these sanctions will likely lead to interesting disputes with interesting legal issues raised. Many deals will be affected and the likely issues raised will be force majeure and frustration. Parties to a contract may specifically excuse non-performance of a contract on the occurrence of certain events in the form of a force majeure clause. Relief under a force majeure clause in a common law contract will depend on the content of the clause itself. Such a clause may exclude or suspend the performance of contractual obligations, while the force majeure event persists. If the non-performance is extended or becomes permanent, the force majeure clause may provide for a right to terminate the contract. In the absence of a force majeure clause, parties to a common law contract cannot obtain force majeure relief and have to rely on the narrow doctrine of frustration, which is also more likely to arise many times out of the current disputes or, or arise in current disputes. A change in the profitability of the contract or increase in cost of, of performance is not enough to amount to force majeure. To invoke force majeure relief, 
the non-performing party would need to show that the relevant force majeure clause has been triggered, which will depend on the precise language and intent of the force majeure clause. Typically, such a clause will list a series of events which are beyond the party's control that constitute force majeure events. Specifically, the events of a party's performance, which the event must have in order for the clause to apply, for example, prevent, hinder, or delay. So one needs to specify what, what effect um, on the performance the event has. Then uh, provide whatever reasonable measures have to be undertaken to mitigate the effect of that event and set out the consequences on the party's contractual responsibility when a force majeure event occurs. So one can speak a lot about force majeure, but um, in any event, um, how the courts are going to deal with them, with these um, issues, will be interesting to see. And I suspect that different courts will deal somewhat differently and will um, find whether a certain event um, is covered by the force majeure clause or not. Then, of course, um, there is an alternative ground for contract relief in the absence of a force majeure clause, and that is the doctrine of frustration, which brings a contract to an end automatically without either, either party's act or election, and the parties are discharged from further liability under it. So apart from interesting substantive law issues, there is interesting procedural problem that is likely to arise out of sanction. Even before the war, there has been sanctions against Russia and many arbitrations involving Russian parties have been affected. This is a large topic altogether and would require a separate review, but one needs to have in mind potential difficulties in arbitrating with sanctioned Russian entities. Finally, I just wanted to mention that both Russia and Ukraine have very limited number of active bilateral investment treaties with African countries. So Kawar mentioned um, a number of um, treaties. So I've looked um, at Russian and Ukrainian treaties with African countries. And I can report that Russia has treaties with 11 African states, but only six of them are actually in force at the moment. More recent treaties, such as the ones with Angola and Equatorial Guinea, seem to favor oil exporting countries, presumably because Rosneft and Gazprom have ambitions to expansion into African oil and gas business. Then, um, when it comes to Ukraine, it only has six treaties, and only three of them are enforced, i.e., ratified. The rest are all ratified by Ukraine but not by its African counterparts. So thank you for listening to me, and I will be happy to answer any questions if time and moderators permit. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for what was a very brief, concise, and insightful presentation on the Russian-Ukrainian situation and how that impacts on energy disputes in Africa. I think most of us have thought that the war may not directly impact the contracts in Africa, but you've clearly dispelled that myth and we're very grateful for the exposition that covered legal substantive issues, such as the application of the frustration doctrine as well as force majeure. We're very grateful to you, David, and we hope that we can engage you further in the Q&A. So our next speakers, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, is our very own Miss Imelda Bore. Um, Imelda is the General Manager, Corporate Affairs, as well as the Company Secretary and Secretary to the Board of Directors of Kenya Power and Lightning Company, which is the main electricity distributor in Kenya. She's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She has over 15 years post-admission experience She's a commissioner for oaths and a notary public, and she holds a Bachelor of Laws, LLB, from Moy University, and a master's degrees, LLM, public finance, from the University of Nairobi. 
She also holds a diploma of law from the Kenya School of Law and a higher diploma in human resource management. Um, Imelda is going to share with us her Kenyan experience in the context of energy disputes, and we're very happy to have her. Karibu sana, Imelda. Asante sana. Thank you, Noel, and thank you for inviting me for this session. Uh, I'd be talking more, spe more, more specifically about the sector in terms of um, electricity sector. Allow me to share my screen. Sorry about that. Mm. Hope you can see my screen. Noella, please confirm you can see the screen. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I won't go into this. This is just what is happening locally on the ground. But just to say that most uh, most uh, power purchase agreements in the energy sector make reference to arbitration. And wherever foreigners are involved, then there's reference to seats outside the country. So most of the disputes for KPLC, Kenya Power Lighting, which is the distributor in Kenya, is the only distributor right now. We have not had very many disputes. Most of the disputes are, pers are resolved through mediation. And this is mainly because the, the property agreements focus mainly on resolving disputes through informal avenues, if possible. And uh, there's the issue of uh, referring matters to experts where possible, and then seek intervention from, um, let's say, the government where necessary. So I'm speaking more from the point of an in-house counsel, not as a litigator. So uh, a case in point with regard to mediation is uh, one involving Kenjan. And uh, this was regard to persons who are going to be affected by the construction of, of a power plant in, um, in Alcaria. So through government intervention, well, they were able to agree on how to resolve the dispute. and. Uh, and displacement of the persons involved. And this had uh, brought the project to, uh, had, I think the project was almost stalling and uh, it was uh, amicably resolved through, in, through mediation. The next issue that I would like to jump into is arbitration. So Kenya is a member of ICSID and also a signatory to the New York Convention on the Commission and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards and also a permanent court of arbitration member. We also, so we have the Debitation Act in Kenya, which is based on the ancestral model law. And uh, in Kenya, we also have um, three international arbitration institutions. We have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrations uh, Kenya branch, and then we have the Ruby Center for International Arbitration and the ICC Regional Office. So most of the power purchase agreements provide for arbitration. And most of them have the governing law as Kenyan law, and then uh, the seat of arbitration generally has been, um, most of the times has been in London, but with the government's guidance, there's a move to have uh, Port Louis in Mauritius as a seat of arbitration. This is mainly driven by the idea, the need to minimize on costs for, should you go for arbitration. And then most of the PPAs rely on um, ancestral rules for arbitration or ICC or LCIA. Then I'd like to just talk about uh, the two cases which stand out in Kenya with regard to uh, electricity disputes. We haven't had many of them, and these two, re re it was mainly the government taken as a respondent. And this is because in Kenya, the structure is that the government sources the, identifies the um, investors to partner with, and then KPLC negotiates the purchase agreements. So the first one is with regard to Kinango Wind Park Limited. So it was a it's a it was a 60.8 megawatt uh, wind turbine plant, and uh, the locals then challenged the issue of uh, the plant being constructed. And the main issues was the lack of proper consultation with the the community and engagement, and there was poor compensation for those affected parties. So they had issues with relocating from their from their affected parcels of land. So Kinangop moved to court, moved to arbitration, seeking to be compensated by the government and a little of support. And their claim was that the government had failed to eliminate, eliminate a political dispute emanating from the protests. 
So the government put in its defense, denied the allegations, and filed a counterclaim and, uh, an order for, and sought an order for costs. The tribunal in its ruling declared that there was no political event within the meaning of the top support and dismissed Kinango of Wind Park's Wind Park Limited's claims and request for reliefs. Then the other the other claim was with regard to Walam Energy Limited. So Walam uh, brought a claim before, uh, to the Nixie Tribunal and the claim was that um, they had been denied rights to construct the plant. And the tribunal found that um, the government was within its rights to terminate the license because uh, Wallam had failed to undertake work within six months as required by the license. So in both cases, um, the government was able to fight off claims which had been brought against it. Uh, just to borrow from what my colleagues, uh, my pre previous presenters had given, from the two cases, I think from our experience as KPLC and the role we had to play, I think it's very important to ensure that we have uh, sound agreements in place because failure to have those agreements will determine what kind of claims can be made against or you can support. So I'd like to talk about um, our experience as KPLC with claims with regard to force majeure. With COVID coming into place, the power supply in the country dropped completely, drastically, and we had to we'll raise a claim for FM against some of the independent power producers. And it was a challenge because some of the PPAs drawn a long time ago did not were skewed to, in favor of the independent power producers. So it was really difficult to agree on. Uh, whether such a claim would, whether a drop in power supply would merit to be taken as a force majeure event. Uh, in, with some independent, some, uh, some, power, some power producers were able to agree on a set settlement agreement, but others uh, weren't able to really advance our claim very well. So the lesson there is to ensure that the power purchase agreements are well drawn and uh, take care of interests of both parties, not just leaning in one direction. Then the other issue which uh, stood out for, which has stood out over time is the issue of ensuring that uh, documentation is well, uh, well stored, is well kept as indicated by my senior. And um, most of these cases, are, most of the properties agreements are 20 years, 25 years. So it's a very long time. And uh, there's need to ensure that the record keeping and as well as witnesses are available to defend any claim that may arise. But the first port of call would always be to pursue an amicable sol solution where possible. Then the other thing is that um, there's always need to ensure that the staff handling these matters are well versed to the issues at hand and are able to step forward with called upon to testify and to elaborate on any matters relating to the claim. So uh, Noel, I hope I haven't been too brief. That is my presentation. That is the end of it. And I want to thank you and uh, look forward to answering any questions should they arise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imelda. I think you have given us all a glimpse and a very good one of the kind of disputes that can arise in the context of an energy dispute, the sort of practical and substantial issues that can be raised. And a few tips on the things that we should think about should we find ourselves representing either a state or a private investor. Thank you very much. Your presentation has been very useful for all of us here who are trying to understand this very complex area of law. Um, last but not least, um, we now have Professor Olwai, who is our last but not least speaker. And he is an international lawyer, a professor of law, an arbitrator, an author, a policy consultant with expertise in petroleum, energy, and environmental law. He currently serves as a senior counsel at McNair International. And in 2015, he was appointed as full professor at Afe Babalola University at the very young age of 32 becoming one of the youngest full professors of law in Nigerian history. He is the Deputy Vice Chancellor 
Chancellor's Fellow and a Director of the Institute for Oil and Gas and Energy, Environment and Sustainable Development at Babalula University in Nigeria. He also holds the UNESCO Chair on Environmental Law and Sustainable Development at HBKU Law School, Doha, Qatar, where he teaches energy and environmental law courses. He was formerly an international energy lawyer at Norton Rose Fulbright Canada, LLP, and he has published several influential journals, articles, and books on natural resources and environmental law. Professor Olwai has lectured on energy and environmental law in over 50 countries, and he has been admitted as a barrister and solicitor in Alberta, Canada, Ontario, and in Nigeria. Finally, in recognition of his substantial contribution to legal scholarship and jurisprudence, Professor Olwaya has been awarded the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria, the equivalent of Queen's Council, in the year 2020, at the very young age of 37, hence becoming the youngest academic ever elevated to that rank. He was appointed by President Mahmoud Buhari as a member of the governing board of Nigeria Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. We welcome you, Professor Luayo, and we look forward to hearing and learning from you. Welcome. Sante sana, Noela. Compliments and greetings from Abuja in Nigeria. And it's my greatest pleasure to be able to join this distinguished panel. Um, I think Professor Koreshi and the uh, previous speakers have done very well um, discussing the meaning of energy arbitration, the key aspects of it. Uh, but I think I will just speak very briefly to the practical issues. And what do I mean? When you go to uh, the Lagos or Abuja airport on Friday, what you will likely see would be senior advocates as well as CEOs traveling from Nigeria to London or to Paris um, to resolve Nigerian energy disputes. And this is an issue that has been of concern to us in Nigeria, especially now in my capacity as the co-chairman of the Legal Education Committee of the Bar. We have been trying to ask ourselves, how can we maximize the full value of arbitration, which is increasing uh, in, in Nigeria? How can we ensure that our lawyers benefit and, and play active roles in energy arbitration. So I'm gonna be speaking to this uh, very briefly. Um, uh, in the next slide, you will see that I will be looking at the history and phases of energy arbitration in Nigeria. And then I would uh, address some of the key challenges that, uh, that, that really mean that uh, energy lawyers in Nigeria have not been able to play as much an active role as you would expect um, from Nigeria, one of the leading exporters of oil and gas in the world. And I'll give concluding thoughts on how we can expand that uh, scope and ensure that our lawyers can play active roles. Um, in the next slide, you would see that um, the history of arbitration in Nigeria can be uh, covered under three distinct, distinct phases. Of course, in the early days, arbitration wasn't popular in Nigeria talk less of in the energy sector. This was a time in which arbitration was seen mainly as the exclusive preserve of white male and pale barristers uh, in different parts of the world. And of course, at that time, you have the famous, you, you have Western institutions such as the uh, ICC and the LCIA and ICSID being the preferred uh, uh, go-to institutions when, when, when it comes to arbitration. Um, Things began to change in Nigeria, though very slowly, when the Arbitration Act was enacted. The first uh, law in Nigeria was the Arbitration Ordinance of 1914, which was large, almost like a cut and paste of the English Arbitration Act. Um, then in the next phase, you had the regionalization phase. This was a time in which not only Nigeria, but many other African countries began to challenge the status quo and saw the urgent need uh, for them to have their own institutions. And you would see that, you know, this was a phase in which we had institutions like the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration in Kenya, the Cairo Regional Center in Cairo, the Kigali International Arbitration Center, and many more. Of course, in, in Lagos, you also have 
the, the Lagos um, Court of Arbitration and, and, uh, and the Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration in Lagos. The, uh, with increased awareness on arbitration, many of these regional centers sought to capture some of the uh, business, uh, that, as you can put it, that would normally go to Western institutions. And in Nigeria, you have the third phase, which I would describe as the Nigerianization phase. And this was a phase that would, was ushered in by the uh, enactment of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1988, uh, which created that unified legal framework for the fair and efficient settlement of disputes using arbitration. Um, this 36 uh, or 30 something year old act was the foundation of arbitration and that saw arbitration becoming so popular in the energy sector. In the next slide, you would see that um, um, during that phase, then you saw a rapid uh, growth of many arbitration uh, institutions in Nigeria. You now have the Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators, NICAP, you have the Regional Center for ICA, you have even specialist ones like the Maritime Arbitrators Association of Nigeria uh, amongst others, and you have the Society for Construction Industry Arbitrators. So you now have a wide range of institutions to select uh, and choose from. But despite this variety, you would see that as of today, um, the seat of arbitration is hardly uh, in Nigeria. The venue of arbitration is hardly in Nigeria. And it raises question. For those that don't know, the distinction between seat and venue is that the seat is the law will be the, 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 the country whose, whose law is chosen to, to govern procedural aspects of arbitration, especially in, in, in energy disputes. So you can say, well, this arbitration, uh, this dispute can be resolved by arbitration. The seat of arbitration shall be uh, London. Uh, the venue shall be, um, you know, Nairobi. So uh, um, the venue is the physical place where the arbitration proceedings will take place, while the seat refers to uh, the, the, the country or the, the, the place that will be, uh, you know, in terms of the governing, the, the, that will govern the procedural aspect uh, of, the, uh, of the arbitration in case there are questions. So uh, what you find is that if, as, you, as you, you go to the next slide, you would see that um, uh, more than 70% of energy disputes involving Nigerian parties are still arbitrated in foreign jurisdictions. And, and according to ICSID record, for example, in 2020, 27% of cases registered under ICSID involved parties from Sub-Saharan Africa, 50% of which were Nigerian disputes. But then they were all taken uh, to ICSID, despite the fact that we have about 10 institutions in Nigeria. And so this, this raised some questions in, in me, of course. Anyone will, be, will wonder why. Why is it that the seat and venue is never Lagos or Abuja in Nigeria? Well, the literature shows that preferences for a seat is based on these key five key factors. Number one, what is the general reputation and recognition of that country, of that city? The arbitration law, is it strong enough? Is it strong enough to give comfort to parties to come? What is the uh, perception of the formal infrastructure? Are courts neutral or do courts intervene to stop arbitration proceedings? Uh, what is the track record of courts in enforcing arbitration? Because at the end of the day, even when you finish arbitration and there is an award, it still has to be enforced, especially if the, the losing side is not willing to, to pay what the tribunal said they should pay. You still have to then go to court to ensure recognition and enforcement. So uh, what is the record of that country when it comes to recognition and enforcement? If it is a country whereby it is difficult to achieve recognition and enforcement, then people will be reluctant to choose that as, as, as the, the, the seat of, uh, of arbitration. Of course, another factor would be the availability of quality and qualified arbitrators who are familiar with that seat. Um, and in the next slide, I then began to ask, how, how does Nigeria fare under each of these? Of course, Nigeria is such a very big and complex country that I, I, do, I do not have enough time to talk about each of these factors. So I'm just going to run through them. And, I, and, I, and I'm running through them to provide lessons for Kenya as, as you think about improving energy arbitration um, in Kenya. For example, Nigeria has not been an ideal seat because of the general reputation, of course, uh, uh, the, the reputation of the country in terms of insecurity, corruption, poor infrastructure, and, and of course, record of inordinate delays by courts in Nigeria to enforce arbitration. All of these have reduced the perception and attractiveness of Nigeria uh, as, as an ideal seat of arbitration. 
Uh, what about the law? Of course, we have a number of laws in Nigeria that refer to arbitration, which especially in the energy sector. You have the local content law in Nigeria, for example, that says specifically that uh, you know uh, Nigerian lawyers should be involved at every stage of energy uh, of the energy industry, including drafting of contracts and including dispute resolution. So these laws already provide a good foundation for Nigerian lawyers to play active role in arbitration. But there are some gaps. For example, the Arbitration Act is over 32 years old. So some of the provisions are archaic and will not uh, you know, fit within the realities of our current time. And I listed some of the challenges. But the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more is the issue of novel energy disputes that are arising as a result of uh, you know, energy transition. The energy industry itself is changing. So there are new forms of disputes, like climate change disputes, renewable energy disputes, energy transition related disputes, and Professor Koresh already talked about some of these things. So what you find is that the 32 year old act is simply inadequate when it comes to gathering evidence, uh, you know, uh, in terms of this new dispute. And that's because 32 years ago when this act was enacted, climate change wasn't a big issue at the time. So there is a clear need to reform this act to bring it in, in terms, uh, to, to bring it in line with contemporary realities. And of course, the good news is that the act um, the, the federal government, of course, set up a committee made up of some of us to look into these changes. And, you know, a bill is already uh, there. And we hope that very soon, maybe in the next few months, the, the, the federal government will sign to this new law and will address some of these challenges. In terms of the next factor in the next slide, you see that um, another issue uh, in the next slide is the, the issue of um, having many institutions, but none really, really focusing on energy. That is a key issue as well, which needs to be resolved if we really want to become a preferred location or seat for arbitration, for energy arbitration. So you have, I mentioned about 10 of them, but none really, really is focused on energy. And when you look at, for example, in Turkey, you have the Energy Dispute Arbitration Center. You have the International Center for Energy Arbitration. You have the WIPO Alternative Dispute Resolution for Energy. And you ask the question, why is it that they, they created these specialist bodies for for energy dispute. That's because energy disputes make, make up a significant proportion of, of arbitration matters in Africa and in many parts of the world, especially in Africa where we have significant energy resources. So it's only commonsensical to, to create a specialist body or a specialist institution that will address all the wide range of new and emerging issues in the energy sector. And, 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 and of course, apart from that, there is also a need for an arbitration or ADR association that will bring together these different uh, cooks, like I call them, many, many uh, centers that are operating at parallel without any coherence. And you have examples, for example, you have the American Arbitration Association, the Swiss Arbitration Association, which sort of provides that umbrella body for different institutions to come together uh, and, and, and uh, act in, uh, in, a, in a coherent uh, manner. This coherence is very important because although lawyers like to think that arbitration is for lawyers alone, in Nigeria, when you, when you go into the energy sector, you find that many of the arbitrators are actually not lawyers. They are engineers. They are, um, you know, some of them have training in, um, in sciences or even in accounting because arbitration is dispute resolution. It's not meant for lawyers alone. As a matter of fact, they will tell you they don't want to see lawyers in arbitration anymore because we complicate matters and, and try to bring all our technicalities from litigation to arbitration. So when you have a, a discipline in which anyone can be an arbitrator, then, then there is a need for that coherence to set rules of professional conduct for the different people uh, acting in this, uh, in this uh, sector. In the next slide, um, you, you would see that uh, another key issue that I've found is that arbitration in Nigeria, especially energy arbitration, is, is, is almost like by invitation only club. It is very, very difficult for new lawyers or new arbitrators to be able to get instructions to participate in energy arbitration. And, and, and of course, I know that maybe in the past I, I, could be, I could have been one of the guilty parties for this, but now uh, in my current role, we are looking at this very seriously to see how we can then integrate younger lawyers or younger practitioners to give them the opportunity to learn uh, because without that qualified pool of arbitrators, 
it's difficult to 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 become an attractive uh, seat and that's why i must you know give special commendation to the uh, law society uh, for what for organizing such an event like uh, like this because you're providing that training for those that are thinking of energy arbitration and are, and are wondering how can they get into it of course they've listened uh, to the very wonderful presentation by professor Parishi, who has been uh, you know uh, very involved in energy arbitration for years so they now know some of the rudiments and i would want to say this is something that should be encouraged and i'm going to take this and take it back to the nigerian bar as well and say let's do more of this and and, and, and provide that practical training opportunities of, of course law firms will also need to do more in terms of creating privilege and training programs that would allow younger members to be involved to learn uh, such that what we find in the energy sector in nigeria today is that if there is any dispute there are probably only five or six arbitrators that keep getting the instructions only five or six you know <laughs> repeatedly getting the instructions which has not allowed uh, you know, younger members to, to learn and to, to develop. Well, in the, in the next slide, you would see that I then argued uh, in conclusion that three things are important if we want to increase the, the value of um, Nigeria and maybe any other African country really as the ideal seat uh, for energy arbitration. Number one, I think lawyers themselves need to show faith in their own countries by intentionally including your country as the seat and venue for arbitration. Why will you be drafting an energy contract in Nairobi and you, you do not consider the Nairobi International, uh, uh, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you do not consider whatever they can offer you? I think we need to begin to um, uh, move towards that uh, Africanization phase in which we consistently uh, provide an opportunity for our own institutions uh, to, be, to be chosen. Uh, as the seat and venue for arbitration. I, I also think, uh, just as we are doing in Nigeria now, reforming the Arbitration Act to clarify the role of arbitration in resolving energy transition related disputes, I think that's something that all, all other African countries will need to consider, especially novel issues like gathering evidence on climate impacts, uh, quantifying carbon credits, carbon disclosures. These are new areas that are not currently covered um, by uh, existing arbitration laws or like legislation so it is uh, it is a good time for if we really want to avoid issues relating to gathering of evidence in these new areas it is important to uh, then reform existing laws to ensure that they at least anticipate these new areas and provide clear guidance and priority on them uh of course a revised act can also provide foundation for greater coherence uh, especially by establishing a body in the mode of an association or society that can provide regulatory coherence, professional ethics. Uh, we've had issues of conflict, issues of uh, you know lack of ethical behavior by arbitrators in the energy sector in Nigeria, and that's because, like I mentioned, many of them are not lawyers. So even though we assume arbitration is for lawyers alone, this we have people coming from engineering who don't necessarily understand some of the ethical aspect of of of, the, of this uh, of this profession. So it might be very important to have that association uh, that will provide that clear guidance for engineers, doctors, and other non-lawyers that are licensed arbitrators. I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you very much for having me on this panel, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Asante Sana. I think you're muted, Noella. We, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I forgot to unmute. Thank you very much, Professor Olawi. I hope I have pronounced that correctly for that very insightful presentation where you've highlighted a very important issue about the evolution of international arbitration in Africa and how these disputes are hardly litigated by Africans in Africa and why this is the case. Yeah. Um, you know, from reasons ranging from lack of expertise to corruption, among others. Um, also, you've highlighted some of the novel, novel energy dispute topics that are coming up, such as disputes surrounding renewable energy, climate change, and you've also suggested reforms in the whole area of international arbitration in the energy sector. And for that, we're extremely grateful for your contribution. And we hope we can hear more from you during the Q&A. 
So my understanding is that we have at least 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A, um, but that was to take place between 3.15 to 3.30. So I'd just like to seek permission from my host to see whether we can take 15 minutes for Q&A. I don't know if David is on the call, if he can just confirm that we can we can take 15 or 10 minutes. If not, I think we can just proceed straight away because um, we don't want to detain you for longer than you had anticipated. And we'll take the first question, which I think should go to David Goldberg. And if I can just read it out loud, and it says that the US is drafting a law to punish African countries that don't respect sanctions that have been imposed against Russia. And he wants to know what is the future of energy deals with Russia? Um, I don't know if it's um, clear. I don't know if something, David, you can answer even as we take on other questions as they come in. David, please proceed. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I can uh, attempt to answer. It is um, clear that um, any deal with um, Russian sanctioned companies will now be affected even before the US in introduces this law, because um, potentially the US um, justice has very long arms and um, extraterritorial effect, arguably. But um, the sanctions themselves are not uh, straightforward. And um, there are certain companies that are covered either by US sanctions, but not covered by EU sanctions or the other way around. Um, or UK sanctions, but not EU sanctions and not US sanctions. And uh, the extent of sanctions also differs. Um, United States, Eu European Union and UK. So what I'm saying is, yes, there will be an effect on any future deal. Um, to what extent it will depend on a particular company, on the on particular deal. Um, Africa will be very attractive for Russian companies now. They will be trying to get into Africa even or much more than they used to be doing it. Um, and there is quite a lot that has been going on. Um, outside of oil and gas, for example, there is also quite a lot. Um, but um, uh, sanctions will be a serious barrier and will need to be seriously considered. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'd like to see if anyone has a question. I think the other question that's on the chat group is on the same issue. It seems to be a, an issue of concern and it's about the future of energy deals with um, Russia amidst the sanctions, which I think David has already answered. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. No, Ella, there was a person who has raised their hand. He's got the card to Shabe Edwin. Perhaps our, our IT person can unmute him and ask him to, to, to ask the question. I'll be very grateful if you can unmute him on your end. And then, um, Katu Shabe, I think you can proceed and ask your question. Edrin Katushabe, are you able to unmute and possibly ask the question that you have? For some reason, I don't think we can hear him or her. They're still on mute. But I think um, just as um, we, we conclude, perhaps I can ask a question of my own. And, and this is mainly around the novel issues that will arise in the context of energy disputes. And I just wanted a bit of an expansion on what are some of the legal issues that may arise in the context of renewable energy and climate change. And maybe Professor Olawuye, you can basically give us a snippet on what we should expect and what we should be trying to educate ourselves on in preparation for these new kind of issues. After that, we'll take a question from Cynthia Opakas, who I can see has raised her hand. Well, thank you very much, um, Noala, for that uh, brilliant question. Um, so many African countries are enacting climate change legislation. 
Just last year, Nigeria released a Climate Change Act of 2021, which provides clear rules for energy companies um, to mitigate greenhouse gases that cause climate change. Under that law, there, there is a reporting requirement. They are meant to report uh, what they have done in terms of integrating emission reductions into their uh, production activities and into their entire value chain. Um, of course, I, you know, it's crystal clear that uh, the moment that act becomes fully operational, then there will be questions about uh, verification. Uh, have you really done what you said? In England, for example, and in many other parts of the world, there are already cases of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 companies being held for false misrepresentation, greenwashing, uh, saying that you've done this. Meanwhile, it cannot be verified saying that you no longer use uh, 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 the dangerous packaging. Meanwhile, you still do. So there are, there are already cases like that in different parts of the world. Um, uh, whether you are talking about uh, greenwashing, whether you are talking about even human rights issues, uh, the mm -hmm. impact of climate change uh, in terms of climate refugees and the likes. Um, um, in, 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 in the Philippines, for example, you have Shell, Chevron and the rest being sued directly for failing to uh, mitigate greenhouse gases so and so on and so forth there are other issues relating to climate disclosures um for example the law says you you should not only do this and the nigerian the new nigerian law says for example it, it's not enough to say you've mitigated you must release certain reports and publish them on your website and, and so on and so forth so uh, of course um when you then have an oil and gas contract that says all disputes will be resolved by arbitration, which simply means this will include climate related disputes as well. Uh, it will be resolved by arbitration, you know. So um, the key question, however, is, and which is what we've seen, um, the, 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 the reluctance of, um, or I would say the, the inability of the Nigerian judiciary to understand climate related disputes, <laughs> you know. You have, uh, you have, you've had a sitting, a, a sitting judge say, you know what is you know climate change is, is an act of god is a punishment for sin you know and so on and so forth so and when you have su such um you know you know when you have that lack of knowledge on you know whether what greenhouse gases are whether you know what is this obligation and, and so on and so forth you could easily see a situation whereby the dispute is resolved by arbitration and then the enforcement can become very difficult you know um when it gets to court uh, so um this why these are i mean these are only snippets of issues that you know uh will arise and and so as we begin to talk about resolving all disputes by arbitration we must understand that there is a need uh for us to have clear guidance on issues of verifying emission reductions uh, quantifying uh, uh, uh greenhouse gas inventories uh, preparing climate disclosure reports and the likes these are risk points for energy companies that they must understand. And these are also issues that our arbitration guidelines and manuals must address in terms of giving evidence when it comes to issues like this. Of course, these are new issues that are not currently covered by existing laws and existing procedures, especially evidence, evidence gathering and the likes. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm going to exercise a bit of a veto because I'm the one that is now left to, to close the session. I think um, we'll take a question from Cynthia. Um, and then I think the question about Nigeria, which is in the chat box, I'll ask Professor Olawi to speak to it. And then I will just like after that for Imelda to answer one question. And you know, Kenya has had a almost perfect success rate in all the energy disputes in the international arbitral tribunals is she able to share with us the secret for that great success rate and then i'd like um, to, to finish how we started and that's with professor Kureshi giving us part in short what he thinks is the most essential tool that us as lawyers here should arm ourselves with or prepare ourselves with um in preparation for any energy dispute that may be referred to us and then i think we can close um i hope that's okay so we'll start with cynthia very quickly if cynthia you can just unmute thank you noella um i have a question for prof Qureshi, which is on stabilization clauses 
which he alluded to in his presentation. And my question is, there has been a lot of discussion on whether these clauses undermine state sovereignty. Um, so I'd just like to have his views on that or probably anyone in the panel. Um, and secondly, and finally, I'd have a question for David. There has been um, reports or the US has been very, has come out clearly to say that they're going to seize some of the assets of um, Russian investors. So uh, my question to David is, what do you see as the future of um, disputes in that regard, given the nature of heavy investments that these investors have um, outside Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. And maybe we shall go straight ahead to Professor Qureshi and then to David. Cynthia, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I just want to echo the comments that uh, were made earlier, the excellent presentations and insights from David Imelda and uh, Damilola. Stabilization clauses, if you look at the presentation that will be circulated, I'm giving the examples from Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya. I've been involved in disputes concerning the propriety of stabilization clauses, and the comment that you've made is a very common complaint that they undermine state sovereignty, but you could make the same complaint about investment treaties, because investment treaties are entered into by states, admittedly at the state to state level, and the state is limited in what it can do uh, in the sense that whilst it can seize assets and expropriate it must do with compensation which is the international law norm in any event a stabilization clause is a part of a contractual framework they've been considered by arbitral tribunals for decades uh, there was a, a, a spate of arbitrations in the dim and distant past involving libya uh, texaco and libya bp and libya were stabilizing clauses and their propriety was confirmed. And notwithstanding the controversy, the best way you can deal with them, if you're advising the state, is to try and uh, ensure that they're not included in your contract, if you are objecting to them. But bear in mind that there are so many other mechanisms available for the foreign investor. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can go straight to David to answer the next question. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, <clears throat> the intention to seize Russian-owned assets um, and to use them as uh, co compensation um, to Ukraine um, has been expressed on um, different levels by different countries in uh, Europe and in the United States and here in Britain. But um, one thing is an intention and the other is actual doing it. Um, I um, do not see legal basis as it stands now for such um, uh, seizure of Russian assets. Um, it well may be that some kind of a rabbit will be put out of a hut um, with some um, legislation allowing that kind of um, a seizure, but um, that would bring uh, potentially disputes um, investment arbitration disputes by those Russian investors, etc. Then also, um, one needs to distinguish between state-owned and private investors, etc. So it is quite messy. It's not straightforward, and um, all it means is that um, there will be disputes, and uh, those disputes will need to be dealt with. And um, um, African countries or um, participants from Africa um, will probably be on the receiving end um, of some of the disputes, including in the contracts for um, supplies um, of um, goods and services. I hope I um, somewhat answered the question, but um, it's not straightforward as it may appear on, uh, on the first glance. No, it doesn't seem to be straightforward, but I think you've done your best to address the issue. I think we, we now have a clearer picture of what to look out for and, and what to consider when these disputes arise. So I think um, next, maybe we can have Imelda and then Professor Olwai after that. So thank you, Noela. To just speak into the Kenyan situation, and I think what has made a big difference for Kenya is the fact that the government and um, all the players have been keen on maintaining a stable environment for investors. So focus on ensuring that investors are able to keep on trusting Kenya as a, as a good oh. investment uh, destination. So uh, well, we've had the government giving letters of support 
to like the power purchase agreement, the 25 year contract. And uh, should, there, should there be a default on this um, power purchase agreements, then the impact should be very high and very adverse for the government. So it's in government's interest and KPLC's interest and everybody else's interest to ensure that we resolve this as amicably as possible. And the other angle also is that um, the PPA themselves provide for mechanisms requiring the parties progress um, systematically before declaring a dispute. So where the technical issues require to bring an expert, financial issues, bring a financial expert. So before you go to arbitration, there are steps you have taken before you declare a dispute. And then the government itself intervenes because the government is exposed in terms of support. So the efforts would be generally to try and forestall any dispute being declared. And then, yeah, lastly, I think it's the fact that uh, we have the the 25, many of those poly, many of the poly negotiate with are parties who are familiar, who've been in the sector for long, who have also been investing in other areas. So the interests, there's nobody who's bringing in any radical issues. I mean, people have expertise and they've been doing it for many years. So it's easier to address and resolve the issues. Nothing is too new in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Melda. And then we have possibly three minutes left and I'll just read out the question that was addressed to Professor Olawi. And it says that I propose more lessons from Nigeria. I understand Kenya and Tanzania, there is a single service provider for energy. I'm just curious how many energy service providers are there in Nigeria and how has that affected mediation or arbitration? Professor Olawi? Thank you very much. It's a brilliant question. Uh, Nigeria is a huge market. Um, and I would, if I were to put a number to the number of service providers, uh, uh, both international and, and uh, local, I would say maybe more than 500. And just last week, um, the Nigerian government awarded another 170 licenses to new companies under the marginal fields program. So, and that can tell you how huge the Nigerian oil and gas market is. And of course, when you then go to the energy, the electricity or power sector, you have a, a whole a, a number of other providers in, in, in terms of utilities and the likes. Um, so what you would see from um, Nigeria uh, now is an increased emphasis on local content. And the 170 licenses that were awarded last week were to local companies, indigenous companies, uh, and, and, and of course, that program, uh, you know, Nigeria generated uh, about $7 million last week, just uh, in that exercise. Uh, so I think that in increased emphasis on local content simply means uh, there is now, um, a, you know, a, a whole range of opportunities for lawyers to be involved in the Nigerian market. Uh, many of these marginal field uh, licensees, 170 of them, uh, will, will require uh, legal counsel. They, you know, they are new in the game, they are new in the field, they will require legal counsel. So before now, effort, focus has been on IOCs, but now lawyers are beginning to see that you don't need to focus on IOCs alone. We have this 170 marginal field operators that are local participants that will require uh, counsel. So I think these opportunities simply mean that uh, uh, arbitration would only become even more popular than it has been in Nigeria. And, and with uh, the new act that is about to be released, we see a clear role for arbitration. Uh, and, and you see Nigerian courts already appreciating arbitration and ensuring that they enforce it. So we, we see, I think Nigerian market will be very, very important in terms of energy arbitration in the next few years. Thank you, Professor. It seems that Nigeria is where we should all be in the next two to three years, because that is where all the money will be made for us. Thank you very much. And then. Last but not least, and to finish off from where we started, Professor Qureshi, maybe you can give us some closing remarks, having your vast experience. What are the most essential tools you think the lawyers on this platform should have in preparation for a dispute, an energy dispute? If you were Noella, to pick two or three. Noella, thank you very much. Once again, as I said at the outset, I'm really grateful to uh, David Goldberg, uh, Damilola, uh, colleagues uh, and Imelda, who obviously I've met for the first time uh, online today. Uh, what would I suggest to all of those who are participating? Uh, a point that I've made again and again over the past 30 years, capacity, uh, understanding. Uh, the problems that Damilolo so vividly illustrated with regards to Nigeria and arbitration, 
Nigeria is trying to tackle, but they relate more to credibility than they do to uh, capacity. There are uh, excellent lawyers coming through in Nigeria, such as Damilola, who have international experience. Once Nigeria is able to bridge the gap in terms of credibility of its, of its system, it's able to enable people to come and go uh, more easily than they do at the moment. And the law, as it relates to arbitration and dispute resolution, the courts are seen to be operating more swiftly, then we'll see changes. And I've got no doubt that there's going to be much more regionalization of, of dispute resolution in terms of arbitration. I've got no doubt that states are increasingly recognizing, begrudgingly or otherwise, that if they want to attract foreign investment, and if they don't want to be hit by large claims from foreign investors, they've got to get their act together. They've got to use their legal system more wisely. But for those of you who are present on this, join more webinars where you can obtain information, have more confidence in your own abilities, build up your own capacity, and in time, five, 10 years from now, working with lawyers such as David Goldberg, such as Damilo and myself and others, you will be sufficiently well uh, versed in the intricacies of international arbitration to conduct these disputes yourselves completely, which is what we should be aiming for, that the capacity is built domestically for as many lawyers in Africa to undertake arbitrations as arbitrators and as counsel. And if this event has played a little part in that, I'm pleased to have done so. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to all our distinguished panelists. On behalf of all the people on this platform, we'd like to say a big, big thank you. Asante, asante sana. We are most grateful for the insights and the knowledge that you have shared. And we hope we can return to this platform another time again to have these insightful discussions. Thank you. Um, so I will just return the control of the podium to our host, the East African Law Society, to whom we are extremely grateful for this opportunity. So I don't know if David or Achilles is on the platform. If not, shall I declare that this marks the end of this. So I can see Achilles has um, unmuted himself. Maybe Achilles should make that declaration. Thank you, Noella. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, members of East Africa Law Society who have joined us, who has joined us today. We really thank you for taking your time and for being with us. Continue uh, having a look at our social media platforms on the other interesting webinars to come. This is not the end. It's just a start and a continuation of more webinars to come. We really thank you for your time and wish you a lovely evening. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Noella, as well. Bye. You're most welcome. Bye.